So welcome everybody to our March um, community meeting. We have Kino joining us today to talk about data governance, but um, we're gonna start us off with our typical group introduction, um, so a member spotlight, some community announcements, and then we'll get into the speaker. So um, if you're new here, welcome. This is our slide that we go over at the beginning of every meeting, um, just to kind of ground us in what we're doing, who we are, and for a collection of Power BI enthusiasts, we are promoting um, opportunities to grow, um, relationships between our community members, and um, opportunities to share knowledge. Um, the share feature, which I mentioned earlier, um, it is a new development for us. We are posting our recordings to Meetup for anybody who isn't able to attend, and we're also posting them to YouTube. So if there's some insight that um, resonates with you that you want to come back and watch later we'll be sharing the link for that in the following slides um we have a website but being virtual it comes with its benefits and drawbacks um one of them being that we can engage folks that are outside of seattle so um if you have any family friends or clients to have um a Knowledge of Power BI, we have speakers that cater to all different skill levels. So um, encourage everyone to invite folks out for those meetings. Um, oh, I'd also like to remind you of our code of conduct. Um, just a reminder to be respectful and understanding of your fellow community members. We're all here to grow and learn and talk about a really cool software. So just continue to be kind and considerate to one another. And then in the spirit of sharing, let's get to know each other. Um, this month's member spotlight is to describe an aha moment that you've had recently. And if you can't think of one now, we'll use the same topic in our next month's meeting as well. But does anybody have like a Power BI aha moment that they recently discovered that they wanna share that they thought was cool with the group? If not, I have one that I thought was pretty cool. Go for it, Alina. Yeah. Um, let's see, I actually put it into a little, I can share my other screen because I, I put it into a little Power BI. So there's no like toggle that's built into Power BI. So I don't know if anybody's seen this, but I had a client request between like a geo view and a, and a leader view. And so you can make a toggle with like a button and then put the text that's in the button as like a little emoji, which is, I thought was like so clever. And it's like a, an easy way to, to kind of, like you just put the text as an emoji and then you move the alignment depending on the user interaction. So when you hover, you can like change it or when you click it, it'll move it to the middle. And then you can enable it to have like multiple with bookmarks. You can enable it to do, oh, here comes my Q&A thing popping up. Um, but I can toggle between leader and geo just with a, with a bookmark. So essentially it's like a button that's the action is the bookmark. And for one of them, I'll have like one button showing another. And I thought that was like so clever. And then you can just like change the items on the screen with bookmarks. I don't know if anybody else has something cool like that. But uh, if you think of something, next month's meeting, we'll ask folks to engage there. And I'll wrap up with some community announcements um, really briefly. So we've had some requests of how do we engage our fellow Power BI specialists? And like, how do we really tap into this knowledge um, of our fellow brilliant community members? And we have a discussion board posted on our meetup page. So if you have a burning question or you have some topic that you're interested in, um, feel free to post there. And um, on the other hand, if you see a question that's posted there, um, we encourage everybody to respond. And then also here's our new YouTube channel. So go subscribe and watch our videos because um, we'll be posting those monthly. And finally, just another plug to get involved. Um, if you have an idea for a speaker or if you want to speak on something or you have a fun idea for an activity, feel free to reach out to me 
um, Andrew Foreman, Russ, um, Wes, or, um, you know, just, um, we want to encourage active participation. Um, yeah, and um, provide meetup feedback. So if there's something that you, you found really insightful or something that you'd be interested in digging into more in the future, um, go ahead and leave that, that feedback in meetup. And I'll pass it off to Gaston to do our speaker intro. Awesome. I I know a little bit of, of this speaker. Uh, Kino Ranger is here today. Uh, Kino works uh, as the data and AI uh, in our Seattle office uh, within Slalom. I've been working with closely with Kino in different projects at SME. He had really great experience on the data platform world. So it's not around Power BI. He knows a lot of the Synapse layer, Databricks, the data lake, great experience as SME in the data platform world. So feel free to connect with him in LinkedIn. I am really glad to welcome Kino to this Power BI seller Power group. And he's gonna you know talk a little bit about data governance and some stories around that. Welcome Kino again. <clears throat> Thanks, Gaston. I appreciate that intro. Let's see, I'm going to go ahead and share somehow. I'm going to share my, oh boy, PowerPoint Live. Just a second. There it comes. I feel like we should have music for, for these points in times, so you know? Like, I don't yeah. know if it would. I don't know if it would be like Muzak, you know, a little elevator music going on, or I don't know. We could, let's think about that. <laughs> they used to say that six minutes were d consumed in every meeting by AV issues, and now it's still true. Oh, yeah. Um, all right, so I'm here to talk about data governance, which is kind of weird um, because I'm not uh, like a preeminent expert on data governance or anything, but I've, I do have some experience in it and um i mean really relevant experience so it's uh it's interesting and then when gaston you said like about power bi if you rewound me to i think 2014 i can't remember exactly i worked for the power bi product team doing the connectors so early days you'd have these content packs and uh that would you know connect you up to quickbooks and other things and and that was the idea behind them getting access to a market and so i worked on that content pack team and uh, we deployed those those things inside of the the big whirly machines of Microsoft. And then again, uh, after just after that, I started working on the con on the the connector team that was is connected with Automate and stuff. So I have a little experience with with Power BI, but I left it behind, <clears throat> traveling to the left on the diagram, uh, so I could come more into contact with um, with uh, data systems. Um, like uh, all the big data systems and Synapse and, and a variety of other things. So a um, little bit about me. I'm a Washington native, so lived here in Washington all my life. Uh, I'm also a consulting native right out of college, went into consulting, um, except for like many consultants do, I took three years and decided this is all crazy and I need to go do something industry. And then I came back to be in consulting again because I, I missed it a lot. Uh, I've been with Slalom now for 11 years, and uh, I'm a data architect, like Gaston said. Uh, so um, big data architecture, um, uh, data strategy, and all these things are my my forte and my projects. Um, all right. So one of the things that my mom used to tell me, and now that I have teenagers, I I definitely um, I definitely hear this is is uh, my mom would say, "Don't make a mountain out of a molehill." And that was a colloquialism for don't make this bigger than it really is. And, and so I'm going to compare that consistently throughout this deck when it comes to data governance, because you might feel like data governance is a giant thing, like a mountain, um, when maybe, maybe it's not quite that big. Um, and in fact, maybe it's not that big either. Maybe it's more like an actual molehill. So because sometimes we have this tendency when something is really big that we overestimate it 
and we shy away from it and we just think that's too big for me i can't really even get involved in that that's going to suck me in i don't know about that right so data governance can be a daunting uh, topic but one of my goals in this chat today is to talk about how that can be not the case and i want to show you the actionable pieces inside of data governance frameworks that we use in our strategy um, our strategy uh, engagements with clients where some pieces are mole hills and some people are some some not people but some parts of it are mountains some there are some big things that you can do in data governance and i'm gonna i'm gonna gravitate towards the mole hills so what is it what does data governance mean one of our clients actually um years ago said don't ever say that word around me again I never want to hear the word governance. It sounds really bureaucratic. It sounds like the opposite of everything that my company stands for. And we, we don't ever want to use that. So we had to carefully re, recalibrate our language uh, around that client, but basically covering the same things. Um, uh, so what is it? It's the exercise of decision making. That's it. It's, it's making decisions and um, it's where there's authority gathered for data related matters. And so you're gonna hear a little bit more about that decision making process. It's impossible to make decisions without something to make the decision upon. And, and being data folks, I think you know where that's gonna go. Um, but data governance is not by itself, like it's not when people say, hey, I need a data governance project. They don't mean I need master data management, I need data platform operations or data quality or all these, all these other templates and standards and stuff. Um, I mean, you might also need that, but that's not what data governance necessarily is. Those are just the vehicles. So I keep using my map, my keyboard, but I need to use my mouse to, to go forward. All right, there we go. Um, so here's some building blocks. So things like, so data governance is these things kind of all, all together. It's data ownership, like, hey, who owns the, who owns the, who's the master? of the, um, the list of channels that we are uh, marketing to, like the marketing channel list that we can all agree on uh, as far as we reach is that who owns that? That's an important thing to have. A data glossary so that you know what things mean, data lineage and traceability so you know where they go, reference data so that you know how you're, you're relating to other, other markets and other, um, that's not right, but other, <coughs> other standards. Um, it's defined processes. But they don't have to be super well defined. It could be something that you do every day. It doesn't mean that you have a swim lane chart and an, an absolute, you know, check the box um, uh, accountability to your process. It may just mean, hey, this is we're we're used to doing this, and this is what we do. That's good enough. Um, another one is data dictionary. I would argue that should be data catalog. There's like these are just words, so and they're just deliverables, and they're just meant to help people. So come up with something that 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 works for you. Uh, but this is this is that that topic. And then there's access controls. Who should have access to stuff? And there's, hey, do we have a reporting catalog? And I don't even know if that's the right word. Like, is it reports that we have access to, or is it, you know, I don't know. Like, it's more than that. Um, and then there's quality rules. Now these other things I put in gray are like, okay, but like maybe you should find another hobby instead before you start going down to this level and trying to manage these these things, like having a metric catalog, okay, if you wanna have that, if that's helpful to you, go ahead. Um, if you wanna decide what everybody's metadata is, okay, if you feel like that's important, but like there's things that you're gonna, you can really spend a long time on. And these are these are some of those, like you, as soon as somebody says critical data elements, I don't know if that's a real thing, so. That's, I mean, I'm sure they are, but I'm like getting everybody to agree on it might be something else, maybe in a small scope, but not, can you imagine saying, hey, Microsoft, these are our critical data elements for all of Microsoft or all of Amazon or anybody else? Let's see. Hey, Kino, uh, what are you viewing as the difference between the glossary and the data dictionary? Well, let's see. A glossary is kind of like a list of definitions. And a catalog is like where you're, where those things are used, right? I think. Okay, that's so. Fair. You can have a glossary that says, "Hey, we're going to say, and you know, TTM a lot, time to market." And so we're just going to. So that could just be a list of acronyms too, right? Whereas your catalog totally. says, "This is all the places that that's used." Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to pepper me with questions any place, and I'll try and watch the chat too. Um. 
Okay, so here's here's some components. Now this is starting to get into data governance a little bit more. There's like this <clears throat> at the top level. There's an organization thing where you you kind of need if you're going to say we're going to have a data governance council, then you need you can't just at many places you can't just do that. Like if you're a small company, maybe you can get away with that. Um, but you're going to be spending some time and energy and effort and you might want tools and you might want people to spend time together and that's going to require uh, investment. And so you need to make sure that that investment is properly figured out at the organizational level. Uh, so that's getting involved in the organization. And then once you all get together, there's like policies and standards, there's processes and practices. There's I realize you don't see my mouse moving around. There you go. Uh, there's and then there's uh, technology and I'll tell you a little side story here is one of the organizations that we worked with we did a big Calibra installation and Calibra is a great great tool for um, data governance it allows you to ingest data about data lineage and taxonomy and it has workflows for for how you um, move things through and how you, what's approved what's not approved and and everything you'd expect but it's a, a very technology first kind of approach and and that took it took a long time. So you have to kind of decide here where 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 are the mountains and where are the molehills? And down here at the bottom is some metrics like that you can watch like, hey, how's our data quality? Well, how do I even measure that as a number? Do I have a meta? Do I have a, a data quality index that I am looking at? I don't know. I don't have the answers for that. I think I think some people would tell you they have the answers, but in the end, you're going to have to find your own when it comes to what are you measuring and what do you, what is important to your business and your situation and your scope and your organ your your maybe not even your whole business but maybe just your group. So here's how I kind of rate these things. My unfold thing is going to work. I'm currently unable to navigate. There we go. Wow. There he is. Now you can see the unfolding. That means stressed out for a second. Um, so organization stuff, usually kind of a molehill. Not that hard. Most people are like, hey, you want to go do something good? Good on you. Go ahead and go do that. Policies are kind of like, that, that's not too much. That's not a mountain. Definitely. It's not too hard. You can make it easy. You can make it crazy. You can make it bureaucratic, but you don't have to. You can start out really small. When you start getting to processes and practices and best practices and common practices and 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 you know all of the process management and trying to trying to impose that upon an organization that that can be a mountain um technology like i described that can be it maybe not it's not mount everest but it could be a pretty tall cold mountain in scotland and so you might want to think about that before um, before you start with technology. Just think, hey, can we do this with spreadsheets and just kind of get this kind of thing going and then we'll see maybe a tool will help us better. Um, and then and again, it all depends on all of this depends on the size of your organization. And then finally, metrics metrics. Those are the easy part. I hope that you have these uh, in general. Uh, and let's see, question is, are you referring to data governance in general or Power BI in particular? Not Power BI. Which is the funny thing, and I asked Russ about that, who got me into this, because Russ and I have been uh, serial consultants. We've been going from client to client, the same client to client, uh, for the past like year and a half, and it's been super fun. I love working with Russ, and then and then suddenly he pulled this on me and said, "Hey, why don't you come speak to the Seattle uh, Power BI user group and uh, talk to him about data governance?" And I said, "I'm having my teeth cleaned, so or extracted," um, but. This is a lot more fun than that. He, he told me all about it. Um, so, but data governance is not usually that one of those topics where everybody goes, yeah, we want we want to go to that um, because of that mountain out of the molehill thing. So there's different types and this is where uh, this is different types to implement it. And I maybe you guys can guess which one I'm going to lean towards. But like there's a centralized model which says we're going to control everything. There's one master person who is the 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 chief of data governance and then they have a team that works for them and they work on processes and they they go around and work on data data quality and and uh and and data governance issues you know things like that one channel list if we want to have one channel list for all of the channels we're providing metric uh, marketing on 
at our company, what if you've got six marketing teams that all sell diff totally different projects, products? You're going to have to have some collaboration on that if and only if you want or need to provide all of reporting at the channel level. And, and you may want to. You might say, hey, you know, this channel is one that we're spending a lot on across our company, and here's where we're spending it and how much we're spending, and, and we know this is the right number. These are the right numbers. And um, and so that's a, that's an example of something you want to make sure that you have, have coordinated. So that's where centralized can be useful. And um, But again, you, you typically have somebody who's directly assigned to this. Uh, a decentralized model is the one that I like the best. I'm giving it to you. Because because it can be at any level. It can be your your whole company because you're a small company. It can be your business unit because your business unit is, has the inclination to do it and others don't. It can be your team because your team wants to produce high quality data and others don't, or they don't do it, want to do it the same way you do. Fine, start with whatever level you can, and that's why I choose decentralized. I think it's the place that that everybody can kind of start, and. Then, then there's these other two models, which are federated and hybrid, and you can see my assessment of those. Like federated can be good because it means we have one person who kind of can go around and make sure that everybody's talking the same language, and if there's something that has to cross teams, we can, but we pretty much let everybody do their own decentralized thing. Uh, the only thing centralized is really that that one person who's or that one, maybe it could be a small group, um, but that small group that keeps things running. And that's where hybrid is. Hybrid is that like small group. I think at that point, you've tipped the scales and started to look just like centralized again. So I'd vote for either either decentralized or federated. Um, and hybrid looks like a complete, complete mess to me. All right, let's see. Next, oh, this has pros and cons. And we can walk through a couple of these, but I think you kind of get the gist, yeah? I mean, um, things are, th there's just inherent benefits in being decentralized. Uh, one of them is that you know the stuff and you don't have to be asking all contextual questions about somebody else's business and trying to make up something, you know, make standards for a business that you don't even know. I mean, like those are both pros and cons, right? But in this case, it's a pro that you you know these things and so you can easily make rules about it. And then, and then what the biggest thing is really about data quality, and that is find ways to measure it, find ways to um, to incorporate that. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But generally decentralized. Comments, questions? Right. Okay. So another thing that I learned doing it, and so we've done this now at two um i've done this i've done this personally at least twice maybe three or four times i don't know i always do some kind of i'll always do kind of like a lunchtime lunch and learn thing with my clients so that if they're scared about data governance that i can at least take some of the fear away away from the topic um get them thinking about it and i've really enjoyed doing that at small companies lately um there are middle and emerging market uh companies are super fun they're scrappy they're the uh, and and many of them have had like either really tough times in the during the pandemic or just like really on fire like crazy busy crazy you know crazy growth over the past couple of years and in any case they're just a small team struggling with these things and uh, and data governance is one that they end up spending if you don't do something it means that you'll spend that there, that energy that you're spending. Um, worrying about it gets spread throughout the whole organization and, and it, it just results in miscommunications and things. And so um, it's important when you get started, and I learned this in all, all of these situations, is start with the top, stop with the most executive sponsor you can find and say, hey, we want to do this and we, we think it's important and you, we may eventually ask you for tools or for people or for money. Uh, or, or for a, a lunch budget, uh, you know, what, whatever you want to start with. Um, but you want to let them know that you're doing it. It's important to have that visibility and buy-in. And it's easy. And this is almost, you know, if you explain it right, they don't get scared. But if they think, never mention that to me again, we're not a bureaucratic company. You have to be careful a little bit, right? But it's, but it is something you need. You need to work that out with your sponsor. And then rolling down a little bit, uh, my favorite part is the data council. And a lot of times the data council is uh, and a working team are basically the same thing. 
uh, in the smaller scale, which is, hey, we're going to get together every other Thursday for 30 minutes and we're going to go through a list of things that are bugging us. And you're going to come from the ERP perspective and you're going to come from the marketing perspective and you're going to come from finance and you're going to come from IT and we're going to all come together and go, hey, what's what's on your hot list? And we're going to work through that list together. That's what a data council is. It doesn't have to be anything more complicated than that. It can be more complicated than that, but you don't have to make it complicated. So, so I've highlighted in green, hopefully you can see these. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see, because um, I can't, I can barely see them. I'm going to just make my screen a little bigger. Um, actually, my screen's going to stay the same size. I'm just going to make my window a little bigger. Let's be clear about that. Um, the executive sponsor for consensus, a data governance council, basically ends up being kind of like that. Yeah, we all agree that's a problem. Yes, and we're going to fix it. So that, like, that's why I think these two are the same. The data governance council and the working team are the same because you you give you, you want people to have consensus. And maybe that's a Seattle thing uh, more so than other places where we're likely to achieve consensus eventually, um, or maybe not. But the but the uh, but the important is, thing is that that's where all of the work is is coming from is that that um, is that is the data stewards and those are coming up uh, into the data governance working team. So I think the working team should be the one that kind of makes that decision. Now this can get blown out if you have a lot of business units or a lot of other groups that you want to work with or you have many governance councils that work together and then you kind of roll them all up. You can make this as crazy as you want. But at a minimum level, and you can totally do this in a minimum level. One client that Russ and I are working with right now, um, we talked to them about this in probably January, I would think. No, 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 maybe earlier than that. Maybe, maybe, maybe December. I think we did, it was December or January. And they said, "This sounds great. We're gonna just we're just gonna start meeting every two weeks." And we're going to come up with a list and we're going to invite everybody and they're a global company. So they've got, but they're a small team. So there's less than 20 of them on this, on this data, in this data council, in this, in the whole data group, anybody who cares about data is less than 20. And, um, and, but they've invited leaders from each of the areas around the world. There, there are three different regions and they all come together every other week. And they, um, they invited me to the first uh, month or so of those. And it's that they they want to know what each other are working on, what are the challenges, and it's not just <clears throat> and it's and it's to work on things that, that that require coordination, that require them to be aligned. That's what they're working on. They're not working. They're not giving a, a report out of whatever they're doing. It's just it's a it's a report out for things that require coordination. And it's been really great, and they've loved it, and it's been really easy and very little effort. So. Um, but they've but what they've seen from it is an alignment. They, now they go like, hey, here's our list of top 10 things. And we all agree that this is the number one and this is the number two. And and we're all in favor of helping whoever's on point for that number one item. Because it is again, it's coordinated. All right, so here's another another way to look at this. And you can already tell that my take on this is to like go really fast from left to right. And um, and what my philosophy is, is that every team and every meeting really has to have something to chew on. They have to have something that they're working on, something to look at. You have to walk in, walk into the into the virtual conference room and put something on the table and say this. This is what we're here to talk about today. This is the product that we built and it doesn't work quite right. And these are the, see if you can find the defects and let's figure out how we fix this thing. So you, you take the virtual equivalent of, equivalent of that, and that's what we're trying to do. So yeah, you've got issues identified and assessed, and you're work, working through them together. Um, you're going to either say, no, nope, that's not important right now, or that's simply not even an issue that we're going to worry about at this level. You can deal with it locally, but we don't have to worry about it you know, from a company level. Um, or like you stumbled upon something so important that we're going to make sure we never, ever, ever do that again, right? Um, those kind of things are what happened in that data governance um, working team and that get bubbled up to a, a working to a data council. Um, you hope that you're not in a really adversarial environment where where, you know, finance has to say, you know, hey, we need to go beat this team up because because they're not 
they're not coding things correctly. They're not, you know, they're not putting the proper um, region codes on things. And we need those for our reporting. And you hope there isn't that adversarial relationship. One way to break that down is to just put them on a working team and get them all together, you know, every couple of weeks. All right, any questions about this so far? It's pretty easy. It can be. This is the part right here, I think. If you don't do this stuff on the right, you'll be okay. If you start with what you have on the left. And that's kind of one of my messages too, is, is it, it doesn't matter what level you're at. It doesn't. It, it, it means like bring to the table what you see in front of you, like and no, and no to notice, begin to know to notice things that can be a bigger, bigger than just yourself. So if you're looking at a pull down list of countries and and you see in that list of countries that somebody has put um, Puget Sound just because Puget Sound is bigger than, you know, has a bigger footprint than many other countries as far as that build, as far as that um, um, that uh, organization goes, that may be okay for reporting, but is it a country? So ask yourself, maybe we should get together on this. Maybe I should make sure everybody agrees. Maybe I should be able to one to, to say, look, can I put this on a list? And can we just eyes wide open decide that the Puget Sound is now a country <laughs> in our systems? And if we all agree with it, that's fine. But if we don't agree and we think we should fix it, then let's figure out how to fix it. And so, yeah, it doesn't. So that can happen at any level. You want to identify the issues and push them up. And then if you can do something about them, great. You've made the world a better place. And if not, then life is normal and you continue going on with Puget Sound being a country in a fake way. And that's just, that's fine. Um, but it, I think it's important to identify and bring it up. Um, and then here's here's some other fun stuff. Um, I mixed these up. You might see these, you might be, you might've seen these before in a different order and I've, Come up uh, recently. I've come across kind of a pattern in these uh, that I don't know if anybody else has picked up on, and maybe you won't agree, but it's that um, for data quality, we're we're measuring all of these things, and they're they're really kind of academic and heady, and and you can make this work uh, for almost anything. Uh, there's um, there's value in this, right? Um, but it's very but how you apply it is the difficult part because it may not all of these may not directly apply to your situation but um, for example um, completeness it measures the discrepancy between data elements some some of that may some discrepancy may be natural it may be uh, a function of the way your environment works and that it gets worked out in the end but but data may come in incomplete or ugly and then it gets filled out later so you have to kind of put all of the all of these into perspective. Um, also, consistency. Um, where are we going to bend on? You know, hey, we all use the, the same date format. Well, I don't know. Is it a global company? Because maybe there's some maybe consistency isn't what we're looking for. Maybe it's local consistency instead of global consistency. Uh, accuracy, reference, all of these things have those same kind of issues. So I started realizing that mainly. Um, there's things that that kind of bring me towards thinking about a model, like a data model or a data set uh, at the at the lowest level, maybe like a data set or Power BI data set in this example, um, or maybe the the dimensional model that I'm pulling from or the reporting tables that I'm pulling from. That's kind of like, is that built complete? Is it missing anything? Is it consistent? Like, what's the quality of that thing that I'm pulling from? And and then there's other pieces that kind of are more related to platform. Like, can I control really whether data is coming in uniquely? Maybe, maybe it's uh, you know, maybe I expect the platform to do that. And when the platform isn't very good, then I get junk in, and then my model is garbage too. So, uh, so I think there's a, a, it's reasonable to say that some of these might apply to platform and model, and maybe some of them will apply to both. That's my novel thoughts for the day. Okay, and then here's some example metrics, which I won't read to you, but you can read. But just some ex ideas about what these kind of things mean. But <clears throat> um, if I leave you with anything, any parting thoughts, it's that it's going to be 
that data quality is something you should know more about, that you should think more about, that you should think more deeply about, that you should really be able to provide on anything you're doing. You should be able to go, hey, you've given me a data set. I've looked at the quality of that. I think it's great, or I don't. And then you should be able to push that up and and then say, hey, maybe I've done this for this one data set. Maybe we should, maybe we should do this for more data sets because it might improve the trust that we have about our data. Or maybe, hey, I've noticed this. It's not really a problem. Everybody expects it, but it doesn't feel right. Let's take this up to a data governance council. Either way, you're creating that list of things to work on. So what can you do? Um, number one, uh, focus on the list, like provide detail, provide the list, provide the items for the list, provide focus on that list. Uh, in other words, like remember the list, bring it back up, say, hey, isn't this one of our top priorities? If nobody else has agreed on a top priority, then you can propose that it's a top priority. Um, and so by doing so, you then become kind of a champion for data quality. And then um, finally, this thing about making data governance meetings fun, and I'm unable to do this thing that I'm about to describe to you, but I wish I could. It, it, there's one, one, of the, one of the organizations we went to the data governance meetings were run, uh, the lady who was running it had, a, she was just a very normal person every day. She didn't talk differently than anyone else and everything, you didn't suspect what she was about to go do. But as soon as she entered the data governance meeting, she ran the radio announcer. And it was hilarious and fast and fun and, uh, and you just wanted to listen to her talk, but she would like she was having interviews with people. She would be interviewing you during this data governance council meeting. And, and I don't know how she did it, but she had a superb attendance. It was very theatrical, but it still accomplished the purpose. So you, she was well within her boundaries of uh, of keeping everything business appropriate, but was was it was an extremely fun idea. So I'll leave you with that awesome challenge to, to see if you can make your data governance meeting that fun. All right, that's that's for me. Any questions? So have Wes run your, yeah, there you go, Wes. All right, so I'll turn it back over to you, Alina. Thanks you guys for, for having me today. Yeah. And thank you for coming out. This was super awesome.